time, your gateway to the world. A-F-R. American Freedom Radio. Give it to them. Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. All right, all right. Good evening, everyone, and happy Tuesday. It is April 23, 2013. Hope you all are having a lovely day, and I'm wishing you all a warm day. I don't know what's going on around here at 80 one minute, 30 the next, but I guess that's spring, so woohoo! Mommy knows what she's doing. Uh, so welcome. Welcome, and thank you for joining us here tonight, Soul Journeys Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Okay, well, we have a very special show in store for you tonight. It is a dynamic duo. Um, We are going to be talking about the paranormal circuits of the human brain with Neil Slade and his lovely and talented wife, Julia Liu. We're going to kind of get both the right brain and the left brain side of creativity. Uh, Neil is the author of 10 books on brain and behavior, including Tickle Your Mind. Amygdala, Frontal Lobe Supercharge, The Secret of the Dormant Brain Lab, and The Book of Wands, Brain Magic 2, and uh, which he co-authored, or at least the second edition, uh, with his wife, Julia, um, Creativity from Another Dimension. It's like two books in one. And uh, Julia, I'm so excited to speak with her. She was born in China and came to the U.S. to obtain her Ph.D. in history and science, then became a lawyer here at uh, University of Missouri at Columbia Law School, and then decided, ah, screw this, I'm going to go paint and have some fun, and woohoo, super excited to talk with both of them. Uh, the website, you can go to Brain Radar. Dot com or Julia Painting dot com and see uh, many of their wonderful creations together, whether it's painting, art, music, writing, and all of this tickle your amygdala stuff. So, um, you know what? I, I might as well let you know now. I just found out our caller line is down. So if you have any questions or comments tonight, uh, you can just show up in the text chat over at Soul Journeys Radio. Dot com and I'll be able to read them to the guests. So I apologize once again. Any questions or comments, join us over in the text chat at souljourneysradio.com. But uh, so good to have you guys, both of you here tonight. How you doing, Neil and Julia? Hello. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> Welcome to the show. How you doing tonight, Julia? Pretty good. Thank you. Oh, it's so good to have you here. How are you doing, Neil? I'm doing great. Excellent. Well, this is cool. This kind of came about about an hour before the show. It's like, gosh, why don't we have Julia on? Is she available to do it? So I'm so glad you were able to be here with us on such short notice, Julia. Uh, We always hear wonderful things about you, whether, you know, Neil's on the show or, of course, on his websites and writings. And this is really neat. I've been admiring your work for a long time. Well, we have a pretty big significant influence on each other. Um, Julie, I had met Julia through, uh, um, she had heard me on another uh, radio show and had contacted me because she was having all of these paranormal experiences that she didn't understand. And I was on the radio talking about paranormal brain activity and those kinds of experiences that, that I had had over the number of the years. And so we eventually met and hooked up, and then uh, we got married a couple years ago. And then I started to experience uh, all of that paranormal stuff now with Julia's input. And it sort of, you know, all kinds of things started uh, happening. And I started to experience with her some of the kinds of things that, that, you know, she was wondering about. So that's how we met. And now I find that... That as I watch, you know, we share an office, and Julia is constantly painting. Um, She's painting eight hours a day, easily, and so I'm I'm finding that my work and my writing, but also my music, is is now being heavily influenced by watching her work as an artist. So it's kind of a two way street there. 
That is so neat. So, Julia, you were listening to Neil on the sh- on a show somewhere, and then just contacted him, and then it turned into this beautiful, magical, creative love affair. Yeah, I well, sort of. <laughs> I heard that he was talking about a brain, and uh, what? No, you're fine. I talk. What? Yep. Ahead, He's putting on my phone. I'm just adjusting the phone. Hold it there. <laughs> we can hear you okay. And you yeah, I'm great, okay. By the way. I, I, uh, you know, he always like to try to control every situation. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah, I'm trying to adjust her phone. That's all. <laughs> well, that's why he needs the right brain, you know? Yeah. I, I heard he was talking about a brain, and I thought maybe he had an answer to my questions. So I went to his website and uh, bought his book, and I tried to translate the book to Chinese because I thought if you can change each person's brain, then you can change the world. And there are like uh, more than a billion people over there. <laughs> So I sent him my translation, and we began to email to each other. The, the, I, I opened. Up, I got one to my mailbox one day, and there was this big Manila envelope, and inside there was this one-inch thick manuscript. Except it was all Chinese, and I had no. I had. I had no warning. I just opened up, and I said, "Who is sending me this? What is this book?" And I'm flipping through, it, and all of a sudden, I start to recognize a couple of pictures. And then it dawned on me that this was my book, The Frontal Lobe Supercharge, in Chinese. And I, I thought, who is oh, this wow. person? Why is she doing this? So that's how that's how we met, essentially. Oh, my gosh. That is amazing. I hope it was our show that you met. Please say yes. Please uh, say yes. I could say yes, but I'm afraid it would be a fib. It was, uh, I think it was, uh, it was Art Bell. Okay. Oh, Billy that's had heard me on Art Bell Coast to Coast. Excellent. So she, oh, that is so great. What a cutie. She, the reason she was listening to that show, because, you know, everybody knows art covers a lot of paranormal stuff. And, 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 uh, and Julia was having all of these very striking out-of-body experiences. Uh, she, she saw her, her deceased father walk on her property one day. She had an out-of-body experience. Experience, maybe she could tell you about that. Um, you know, uh, the one that I that comes to my mind was uh, maybe you could tell her, Julia, when you took a nap in the afternoon and oh, flew okay. to China. Yeah, that's one one uh, one afternoon. Actually, it's just past the noon. I took a nap. I had a habit to a nap <laughs> since I was a child. So I took a nap, and all of a sudden, without any other like a People talking about the vibration or something, or see your body flu over the window. No, I didn't have any of that. I just feel I followed to sleep, and then all of a sudden I was in China. I was on the railroad station of my hometown. Um, in front of that railroad station, there's a square. People always get together on that square to have meetings. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I was there, and it's dark. So I I look at the clock on the top of the rail, railroad station. The clock says two o'clock. So I thought it must be two in the morning because it was noon in America. You know, the funny thing is, that I can think logically, and it was weird. And I look around the two tall buildings I never saw before. And uh, it's about 20 stories tall, and it's absolutely dark. All the other buildings surrounding those two buildings have some kind of light, but those two buildings are absolutely in dark. So I wow. wonder, is this real? This looks so real, but I cannot be here. So I'm thinking I'm dreaming. I remember when I was a child, my grandma used to tell us that uh, if you don't know if you're dreaming or not, then you can bite your finger. I've heard 
then you are not dreaming. Otherwise, you are dreaming. So I thought, okay, I better try that. I look down, try to find my finger, and I have no finger. Not only have no finger, I have no body. I just feel so weird, and I feel cold. It's funny, you don't have body, how can you feel cold? But I really feel cold, very cold, icy cold. <laughs> and uh, wow. it's a kind of feeling like you out of uh, when you're swimming and you're out of water, you suddenly feel cold, with that kind of cold. So I thought, uh, oh, my God, I better go back. <laughs> and as soon as I thought about that, I was on the top of the cloud and uh, just feel like in minute you in second you know like uh, instantaneously you're passing the ocean the the, the mountain everything and uh, without any sound it is absolutely in silence you you thought if you fl- you fly um passing the ocean there would be sound but it, i didn't hear anything and uh, i just wake up on my bed <laughs> I tell feel, her about tell her about when you called I feel so, and told her what you Okay, I feel so weird so and everything is so wavy, not like a normal dream. You know, you forgot about. But this dream just stay in my mind and whenever I close my eyes I see the building, I see the clock. I was I called my sister in China, ask her if there's any two buildings in on the railroad station that are new. And she said, uh, oh, well, there are two buildings they build as a hotel. And I said, uh, um, are they occupied? And she said, uh, no. They try to, um, they, when they build that, they want to use that as a hotel, but they don't have enough people to... Uh, use those hotels, so they decided to abandon it because the operation fee cost would be more uh, than, you know, than abandon them. So they abandoned the, the hotel. So they never turned the lights on. Yeah, that's why it's absolutely not. So I was almost fall down from the chair. I said, oh, my God, then that was real. Wow. <laughs> I, I was there. How could it be? So I begin to go internet to looking for answers. I try, I go to different sites, try to find out. I I saw people talking about uh, out of body experiences, the remote review, and um, you know all those all those kind of experiences. And I haven't find anything exactly or very close to what I experienced. Yeah, I no, even I bought a book about. You know, projection, whatever, and I. That's why I eventually listened to our bell show and Fan News website. <laughs> and I was Amazing. supposed to know the answer to that. <laughs> so you were having those experiences, and then you came across Neil talking about brain and paranormal circuitry, and figured, ah, this must be the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and well, actually, did you get any it's, answers? It's kind of interesting because. <laughs> Just this past year, I started looking more into the paranormal abilities of the brain, although I've always been interested in that. And, you know, I've come up with some some new ideas in terms of what her experience at that point, you know, why that happened and as it did and so on and so forth. And and what I I found is that there's actual processes within the human brain that lend itself, you know, so people are more prone to have that type of experiences uh, and other types of brain processes that would, uh, uh, contrary to that, inhibit those kinds of experiences. Huh. Well, that is a really interesting topic. I would definitely like to understand it. So, Julia, um, you you found Neil and figured, oh, well, maybe he'll have some answers and be able to explain this to me, what's going on. Um did you get the answers you were seeking? Not exactly. You will explain that. <laughs> <laughs> but that experience really changed my life. You know, without that dream, I wouldn't be where I am now. <laughs> A full-time painter. 
you know, I never thought I have artistic、uh, talent at all. I went to school to study, you know, philosophy, history of science, and、uh, history of、uh, philosophy of science. And I, and、um, you later study law. All of that in the secular level. I never thought I was a spiritual person. I have artistic talent, but I, I am, and I do. <laughs> and that's that's so. Great. I think in in Julia's case, the paranormal experiences sort of shook her up.、Hmm. I I think that so that was something totally new. It was it was something that was just was really outside the realm of her understanding. Yeah, it, it was totally perplexing, and, you know. And she had a number of other experiences like that, and so she had to start finding the answers to that. But ultimately, it led to a complete, in her case, a complete change in lifestyle, where she she abandoned, you know, the 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 the, the PhD and the law degree is very left brain, very analytical, <laughs> very linear type of experience, and it led、oh, to a complete 180 degree turnaround in her life. I can't wait to hear about that turnaround, but it is that time we have to take a short break. So hang on, everyone. We will be right back with Julia Liu and Neil Slate here on SoulJourneysRadio.com. It's time to get real and heal. MyTrueEssence.net would like to tell you about Modifiland Brown Seaweed Extract. It's composed of an elementally rich seaweed called Laminaria. It takes 40 pounds of Laminaria to make just one pound of Modifiland. There's nothing else like Modifiland. It is the richest in alginate, fucoidin, organic iodine, and Lamarian. Alginates are the most effective organic element in nature that enable the body to rid itself of heavy metals, radioactive elements, and toxins. Fucoidin is an extremely effective anti-cancer substance found abundantly in brown seaweed. Organic iodine is the greatest protection for the thyroid offered by nature. Laminarin aids in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Go to www.mytrueessence.net and click the Modifiland banner to get started on your path to rich health today. Also, check out the Healing Shop for proven essential oils, medicinal teas, and even health coach. It's time to get real and heal. Go to www.mytrueessence.net. Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. And thanks for joining us here tonight, Soul Journeys Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. We are joined by the dynamic duo tonight, <laughs> Julia Liu and Neil Slade. Julia's website is JuliaPainting dot com. You can check out some videos and her beautiful art gallery. And Neil Slade is the author of ten books:、uh, "Tickle Your Amygdala," "Brain Magic," and many others, which you can find at his website. Brainradar.com, and I'm really enjoying the story. How you two met, Julia? I would love for you to tell us、um, how did the creative aspect of yourself come out? I mean, were you exhibiting signs or longing for painting while you were in school, getting all of your doctorates and your law degree, or was it just a switch that happened after? No, I, I actually、uh, earlier than the dream, I had、uh, taken some classes in fine art. That was because in graduate school, one day, a friend of me、uh, of my gave me a test to test,、uh, you know, if you left brain or right brain, left brain or right brain person, because he studies.、Um, Cognitive science, so he's interested in that. And I took the test, and to my surprise, I discovered that I was the right brain person. I never thought that way. It's funny because I always interested in math, in physics, in astronomy, you know, in science, not in art. And I think I couldn't even draw straight lines. 
Wow. But uh, um, after I took it out, I thought, mm, maybe uh, the universe tried to tell me something. Maybe I should uh, see what my right brain can do. So I took uh, some fine art courses and uh, began to paint. And, um, Amazing. <laughs> I, I think the tip-off was she told me she was she was in a in court one day and discovered that she was so engrossed in in doing drawings of all the people in the courtroom, <laughs> she was losing track of what she was supposed to be doing as a lawyer. She thought, if I'm doing this, maybe I shouldn't be a lawyer. And at that point, she started telling me about this. And I said, Julia, just come to Denver and and uh, you can paint full time. So that was how I sort of convinced her to come to Denver. Oh, that's awesome. So you just gave it all up and just said, oh, I'm going to Denver and going to paint. Yeah, because the one, um, one after I had that dream, I began to see things. You know, like I close my eyes, I will see uh, flowers. I will see the sea waves. I will see the, the, the boats and the shape. I will see the trees. I see all kinds of things just in front of me, I mean, actually, I feel like uh, on my forehead, there is a screen, like a uh, computer screen. <laughs> I had a colorful images all the time. But before, I didn't notice that. Now, it's so obvious. Especially, like uh, for months, I will see the same flower again and again. It's not, it looks like a white, but it's not a pure white, like a snow. Inside, it had a different tint of color, and it's almost translucent. Open up, close it, turn around, just in front of you all the time. So I thought that I should pin that. I tried, tried. I never can capture the beauty of that flower. So I end up <laughs> pinning like a hundred of different flowers. Trying <laughs> to get that one. Oh, Christy, I'll tell you one really interesting thing that dawned on me about the way that, you know, Julia is a great subject for me because I write on brain and paranormal. So now I'm living with this person who's having all these experiences that are, you know, pretty extraordinary. And I have them myself too, but not to the extent that I know that Julia does. We're in bed one night with the lights out. <laughs> And, you know, it's one in midnight, and she's looking up at the ceiling, and she's pointing. She says, oh, look at that. I said, look at what? She says, don't you see those things on the ceiling? <laughs> and she starts describing these objects that she is seeing. You know, one night they were faces. Another night they were like uh, cucumbers and these odd amoeba-like things on the ceiling, and she's describing the shapes and the colors. So it's like her brain is naturally, apparently, tuned into these wavelengths. Maybe she's seeing into the infrared, or maybe she's seeing into these other dimensions, but she's, she's tuned into this other wavelength where she's describing in bed, in the complete dark, all of these images and things that she's seeing. Either that or she's ready for the loony farm, one of the two. <laughs> no. Actually, Maybe we all are. <laughs> no, no, actually, I, later I figure out I'm just more sensitive to the light. I can, when you turn off the light, the ceiling is not solid one color. It has different shade of light and dark, so they form different patterns. Neil couldn't see that because he's not that sensitive to the change of light. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Now, Julia, when you decided to quit your job, what did your family think or your <laughs> colleagues or your friends? Did they think you lost your mind, like you're going to quit all of your hard work, all of these years getting these degrees to go paint? <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, what happened is uh, uh, one day I was in the court, I was you know, as usual, I was to draw everybody in the court, the judge, and my clients, and the other lawyers. And I suddenly feel like I was up. 
I mean, I was like out of my body, look down the core room. I saw myself, you know, drawing, and everybody else was pay attention to what the judges say. So I thought, uh, that's odd. I'm supposed to pay attention to what's going on now, not on my drawing board. So I thought, uh, well, maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. So later, I I thought about it, I thought about it, and I had a revelation. I suddenly realized if I do not do my, I do not practice law, other attorneys may be more um, passionate about the law or more experienced. They will will take my case. But if I don't draw or paint, nobody else will create my art. I think yeah. that's the pending point, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So I thought everybody come to this world had their own purpose. You well, you had, you had asked, didn't you ask a professor? You told one of your your law yeah. professors that you were thinking of quitting. And yeah. what did he say? I said uh, I'm I'm thinking about uh, uh, become a full time artist and. He said, uh, as you, you know, you need to think about uh, why you practice law. If you practice law is just a job, then you shouldn't do it. And uh, uh, I said, uh, no, I, re- I, I do enjoy help people, but I think, you know, that's not uh, what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> he said, uh, I support you, follow your passion. And then I found an attorney who can take all my cases because by that time, uh, I already set up my own law office and my business began to boom me. <laughs> I mean, I have more cases that I can handle. Mm. So I give like uh, all my cases to my friend. She is uh, like uh, have more experience than I did at that time. So, um, and she supported me. She said, you should paint. She always liked my painting. When she set up a new law office, I did a painting for her office. And they're still hung in there. She tell everybody I did that. But, uh, yeah. And to my surprise, is some of my clients, you know, did support me. And the one late, lady in particular, I remember, she emailed me said, Julia, if you can paint something so beautiful, why stack yourself yourself in the in the core room? <laughs> Excellent. I thought that was yeah, that was to my surprise because I thought that they would say no, don't do that, don't leave us. <laughs> but they did. Yeah, that's wonderful. So you did have support. And- I did have support. Yeah. Oh, uh, what a great story. So, okay, here you are, Neil. Yeah. Um, you had worked for 11 years at Colorado's Dormant Brain Research and Development Laboratory. Who knew you were going to have a subject uh, be moving in with you? <laughs> well, that was quite, that was quite, that was 25 years, yeah. you know, before I met Julia. But what's interesting is that her experience in particular, really reflects exactly what I came to write about many years earlier, which was that inside the human brain, there's a there are two little buttons I call them. They're they're part of the they're part of the brain called the amygdala, and you have one in your the left hemisphere of your brain. You've got another amygdala in the right hemisphere of your brain, and what the amygdala is is an emotional it's 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 virtually an emotional compass Mm. that either repels you from something that's not good for you or it attracts you towards something that is good for you. Um, And uh, uh, and so the amygdala is like this internal compass that you have in your brain, and it works through emotional, I call it emotional magnetic. And it's, it's how the brain is supposed to work. For example, um, it's the reason that we have pleasure and pain inside the brain. It's, it's the reason why some things we're attracted to emotionally that gives us pleasure 
and other things were repelled for. And the brain has this sense, it has an emotional memory that it remembers those experiences that are, that are detrimental to our survival and it remembers those experiences that are uh, enhancing of our life experience and survival. So through our emotions, the amygdala either points us in a direction, it says, go this way, it feels good, right? If something feels good, we're attracted to it. And, and the brain is trying to guide us through this amygdala compass. And so in Julie's experience, that's exactly what happened. She found that she was deriving more pleasure from her artwork than she was from doing the legal work. And even though the legal work paid infinitely better than painting, believe me, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? The emotion, her amygdala was saying, no, don't go to, down the law path, go down the art path. And the difference is, Julia is, she dances and sings all day long. <laughs> and she is the, you know, she is the happiest person I've ever met in my life. I tend to think there's something wrong with her brain, she's so happy. <laughs> but she's doing what, what her brain told her. It says, go this way. Go in the direction that your amygdala is giving you satisfaction and pleasure. And that's what she did. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's paid off and paid off in terms of her own quality of life. And that's, that's the way that the, the brain and the amygdala work. You have this built-in compass that's telling you, go this way. And it, and it also says, avoid this. Hmm. That's what the amygdala is all about. Now, what would our life be like if we chose to go against it? For example, Julia loves to paint and, you know, that really turns her on and makes her happy. But if she would have stuck with law for, you know, whatever types of pressures might, oh, you need to do this for the money or you need to make your family proud or whatever other reasons that we choose to stay thing, involved in things that really don't make us feel that good. Well, I think everybody knows the answer to that question. You yeah. have a miserable what? life. You might have the fanciest car, and you might have a big house, and you might have tons of money, but life isn't worth living because of stuff. It's worth living because you enjoy what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, hold that right there, though. It is that time, and maybe we can talk about uh, any evidence or what exactly happens to the amygdala and other parts of our brain when we choose to consciously shut them down. But stay tuned, everyone. We will be right back. SoulJourneysRadio.com. It's time to get real and heal. MyTrueEssence.net would like to tell you about Modifiland Brown Seaweed Extract. It's composed of an elementally rich seaweed called Laminaria. It takes 40 pounds of Laminaria to make just one pound of Modifiland. There's nothing else like Modifiland. It is the richest in alginate, phocoidin, organic iodine, and lamarian. Alginates are the most effective organic element in nature that enable the body to rid itself of heavy metals, radioactive elements, and toxins. Phocoidin is an extremely effective anti-cancer substance found abundantly in brown seaweed. Organic iodine is the greatest protection for the thyroid offered by nature. Laminarin aids in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Go to www.mytrueessence.net and click the Modifiland banner to get started on your path to rich health today. Also check out the healing shop for proven essential oils, medicinal teas, and even health coach. It's time to get real and heal. Go to www.mytrueessence.net. Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. Yo, what's up? Check this out. The voice of the revolution. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. All right, welcome back, and thanks again for joining us here tonight. We are having a good time with Julia Liu of JuliaPainting.com and Neil Slade of BrainRadar.com. Uh, I think they pretty much have the left brain and right brain uh, 
uh, all wrapped up, a uh, dynamic duo, absolutely uh, artistic and beautiful couple uh, sharing their experiences with us. And uh, we left off, you know, asking, well, what happens when we choose to suppress ourselves? So, yeah, do we have any physical evidence as to what happens to our brain, uh, specifically the amygdala, what we were talking about before we went to break, uh, when we consciously choose to go against what makes us feel good? Um, is there some deterioration or something noticeable? Well, you, well of course, and, and most people know about this uh, as it relates to stress. Um, by the way, can you hear me okay? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. So... So here's how, here's how the brain, here's a model of the human brain. Um, this model of the human brain was uh, uh, discovered or coined by a fellow named Dr. Paul McLean of the Laboratory of Brain Evolution and Behavior. And this was back in the early 60s. And he realized that the human brain has several different layers. And at the very innermost core, you have this reptilian, it's called the R-complex. And he, he called it the reptile brain because it's the part of the brain that computes the very basic functions related to survival. Uh, it, it regulates our heart rate. It regulates our body temperature. It's responsible for the fight and flight response. And it's that part of the brain that functions very similar to the brains of simple reptiles like turtles and snakes. Mm -hmm. And then... That's surrounded by more layers of the brain, one called the mammal brain, which adds on social, basic social behaviors and emotions. And that's surrounded by yet another layer of the brain called the primate brain and the frontal lobes. That adds on very complex behaviors and thinking processes, okay? Now, the emotions sit right, the, the part of the brain that computes emotions is located right in between this reptilian core and this very advanced frontal lobes and primate brain. And the way the emotions work is that when we are clicked backward, when the reptile brain is revved up in high gear, uh, whenever we feel threatened or whenever we're tempted by very basic instincts, we tend to we tend to be clicked backwards into a more negative frame of mind. Uh, when you're clicked into fight or flight, when you feel threatened, uh, when you're just reacting to the environment, ultimately it leads to negative emotional experience as a rule. Um, on the other hand, when we're clicked forward into high creativity and cooperation and high levels of of very high levels of intuition, um, logic. When we're clicked into this more advanced part of our brain, we're given positive emotional feedback mm. as a rule. So the brain rewards us for using the more advanced parts of our brain, and it rewards us through pleasurable emotions. And at the same time, when we're clicked backwards into competitive behaviors and fight or flight, we're discouraged by negative emotion. Okay? So when we're when we're oh, Chloe our dog is <laughs> Hey Gloria, would you get Hi, baby. Hi. <laughs> That's our lovely dog barking at, at someone walking in front of the house. Anyway, um, that was a good example of her being clicked back into her reptile brain. <laughs> All right? So we had a a demonstration right there, right? Being clicked back into competitive fight or flight response, right? So when you're, so the, the idea here is when you're clicked back into this reptilian reactive brain, you're given negative emotion and that creates stress and it causes detrimental effects not only on brain function, but on general physiology as well. The more stress and negative emotion you feel, the more wear and tear that that causes on your body. So the trick here is you want to stay tickled forward into those advanced creative frontal lobes functions, and you want to kind of turn down 
that fight or flight reactive process. And it's much healthier to do that. Oh, yeah, definitely. What do you, um, so you, you basically, in short, I guess the result of consciously denying yourself is death. Well, it, it, here's, here's what's going on. Your brain is, is rewarding you. In other words, every, every person's brain is unique. We all grow up with different experiences. We all grow up in different environments. So, we, so consequently, we all, each person grows up with a unique set of skills, whether they be intellectual or whether they be more physical types of skills or abilities. And we're drawn to certain, we, we are naturally drawn to certain activities just because of our nature. Mm-hmm. And the, the brain encourages, encourages us to move towards those types of behaviors and skills that we are naturally more adept at. Either we've, we have a uh, predilection because of genetics, or because of our environment, or because of teachers or our parents. And so the brain learns what you're good at, and it makes you feel good. It gives you that that reward system. And it may not be because it's fully developed, but because the brain recognizes that you have potential in a certain area. And we saw that in the case of Julia. She wasn't particularly experienced at fine art, but yet... She discovered through this testing that she was right brain, that, that, that she had a skill for this. Mm-hmm. And even before she took the test, she had a feeling, and she knew that it was pleasurable for her to engage in, in drawing. So her brain was already ahead of the game, and it was giving her reward, and it was trying to push her towards an activity or, uh, that, that she naturally was good at, which was artistic, as opposed to the academic kinds of stuff. Okay, so when we're kind of in tune with that, or say tickling our amygdala, so to speak, then it increases our creativity power, power of perception, intuition, etc., just naturally? Well, that, that's you, you're, you're talking about a couple of different things there, okay? So one thing you said was tickle your amygdala. And the idea here is, okay, so you've got this emotional compass, which is located midway between the reptile brain and the advanced frontal lobe. And the amygdala rewards you when you're using your frontal lobe, and it sort of kind of slaps you on the butt when you're stuck in this reptilian fight-or-flight reactive. Okay? Now... If you don't know that you have an amygdala, if you don't even know that you have a reptile brain or frontal lobes, what's happening is the amygdala, sometimes it's being tickled, and sometimes it's, it, you're getting bitten by your amygdala, okay? When you go forward, your tickling is being tickled, right, for pleasure. When the amygdala is clicked backward into reptile brain, it's kind of like you're getting an amygdala bite. It's discouraging you. For most people who don't understand their brain or that they have an amygdala, it's, your amygdala is, quick, is being tickled or being bitten just because of what happens to happen, not because you've got control. The beauty of it is that you can exercise control. The amygdala is something that you can exercise control and purposefully tickle it so that you get the reward happening, not just because something happens to happen, but because of deliberate brain self-control, as it were. In other words, you can use the most advanced part of your brain to kind of turn that dial so that it's giving you that reward consciously, not just because of an accident or just because you just happen to stumble across something. You can make that amygdala tickle forward into pleasure instead of just sitting around waiting for it to happen. Okay. All right. I was just wondering if there were any um, 
Well, beneficial results from just without even knowing that you have an amygdala or never even hearing the term tickle your amygdala, is it automatically kind of turned on strictly by the act of following your heart and doing what feels good? Uh -oh. That's a big, yes, it's a big part of it. The, tr the real trick is, is... If, if yeah, you I'm so sorry, Neil. It, it's that time. We're getting cut off here. So please hold that answer till after the break. We will be right back with Julia Liu and Neil Slate here on SoulJourneysRadio.com. It's time to get real and heal. MyTrueEssence.net would like to tell you about Modifilan Brown Seaweed Extract. It's composed of an elementally rich seaweed called Laminaria. It takes 40 pounds of Laminaria to make just one pound of Modifilan. There's nothing else like Modifilan. It is the richest in alginate, phocoidin, organic iodine, and lamarian. Alginates are the most effective organic element in nature that enable the body to rid itself of heavy metals, radioactive elements, and toxins. Phocoidin is an extremely effective anti-cancer substance found abundantly in brown seaweed. Organic iodine is the greatest protection for the thyroid offered by nature. Laminarin aids in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Go to www.mytrueessence.net and click the Modifilan banner to get started on your path to rich health today. Also check out the healing shop for proven essential oils, medicinal teas, and even health coach. It's time to get real and heal. Go to www.mytrueessence.net. Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. All right, all right. Welcome back. Top of the second hour here tonight. Soul Journeys Radio on AmericanFreedomRadio.com. And just to let you all know... We are having problems with the caller line tonight, so if you have any questions or comments for our guests, you can join us in the text chat over at souljourneysradio.com. Just click on listen and chat, and I will uh, read your question to Julia and Neil, uh, brainradar.com and juliapainting.com are the websites and uh, the paranormal circuits of the human brain. We're kind of getting into that. I know we've been having a lot of fun here uh, in the first hour and now we're going to get a little clinical, maybe go from the right brain to the left brain. Um, but yeah, so Neil, I, I asked you right before we went to break, um, can we, without even knowing the amygdala exists or, you know, the, the term tickle your amygdala, is it possible that we tickle it naturally just simply by doing what feels good? Uh, I would say no. <laughs> and okay. the reason I say that is I, it, it's mm -hmm. fairly obvious. For example, have you ever done something that felt really good at the moment and then you regretted it later on. In other words, yeah, I was I was twenty uh, uh, a couple yeah. times. <laughs> well, well, you know, you know, look, somebody, a good idea. <laughs> somebody, you know, for example, you hold out a bowl of candy in front of a kid, and the kids, oh yeah, I love the taste of this chocolate, and they eat and they eat and they eat, and then they get sick, right? Adults, yeah. maybe they'll go out for a night on the town and they'll, they'll, hey, this beer tastes really good. I think I'll have another. Oh, yeah, I'm feeling so good right now. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have another. And But then there's a reality hangover later on, right? There's yeah. that, 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 uh, that rubber band effect. And the reason is because if you go... Strictly with what you're feeling at the moment, the primitive part of your brain doesn't know the reality hanger, re reality hangover that could be around the next corner. And for that, you need the more advanced frontal lobe. And what the frontal lobes do is they calculate cause and effect. The frontal lobes understand concepts of time. Your frontal lobes have the ability for abstract imaging and imagination. And none of these types of processes are available to the, just the strictly feeling part of your brain. 
you know, a lot of people talk about heart, you know, and they talk about uh, um, uh, compassion and love. This is these are actually processes that happen in very specific regions of the of the human brain. As it turns out, compassion and empathy and abstract thinking and imagination and concepts of time, these happen in your frontal lobe. You have to be able to see more than what's just two inches in front of your nose. The reptile brain, the primitive part of your brain, has no ability to see into the future. It has no ability to learn from past experience. The more advanced parts of your brain does. So when you talk about following your bliss, most people tend to interpret this as what what you're feeling at the moment. But if all you do is engage with just the moment and you cut yourself off from seeing consequences to your action and you cut yourself off from learning from past mistakes, you'll be no better than uh, uh, a a a very you know a snake that's that's only living on a rock at a moment and doesn't see into the future and doesn't see into the past. So you have to engage. I'll, I'll give you another example. You have a left and right hemisphere of the brain, right? Mm-hmm. And are you familiar with the differences between left brain and right brain? Um, yeah, a little bit. But Tell me what what you what your impressions of the differences between right and left brain thinking would be. Well, right, I, I'm definitely right brain. Um, <laughs> maybe more feeling and feminine and uh, creative, and uh, where the left brain more clinical and uh, you know uh, like statistics, uh-huh. and science, and things like that. Okay, all right, that's part of the definition. A right, your right brain functions by seeing the big picture. It sees a fuzzy big picture. It doesn't concentrate on little detail. Okay, the left brain will con- will focus on very small detail of things. For example, just like humans, a bird has a right and a left brain. So when a bird flies down on the ground to pick up some seeds. The left part of the bird's brain is focusing on what's immediately in front of it, where that seed is on the ground. It says, there's a good seed, no, that's a pebble, here's a seed, right? Mm. While that left brain is focused on something small, the right brain is also aware of the whole environment, so that if there's a fox sneaking up, or if there's a, if there's a predatory bird in the air above it, the bird is aware of the of its position in the whole environment. So if it didn't have that left brain to focus, it couldn't pick up, it wouldn't be able to find and focus seeds. But if it didn't have that right brain, it wouldn't be able to be aware that it might, you know, that it needs to be aware of the total environment so it doesn't become somebody else's meal. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. You need both sense. that right brain and the left brain side. So in human beings, our brains function in the same way. Now, uh, the left brain is very linear, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 1, 2, 3, 4. It it has that linear type of logical thought, right? The right brain is, doesn't, is, the, the language areas are on the left side of the brain, but the right brain sees a big picture. It sees how one fits into the global environment, it understands spatial relationships. It understands music and art, right? But we need both sides of the brain. We need both the big picture and we need the little picture. In the same way that we walk better because we've got a left brain, we've got a left leg and a right leg. We see better because we've got two eyes that allow a stereoscopic vision. If you cover up one eye, you lose your depth perception. It's better to have two eyes, a left eye and a right eye. Your hearing is better because you have a left ear and a right ear and it allows you to hear in stereo and you can gauge direction. And the brain is the same way. You need 
that left brain logical, you know, if you lost the ability to keep track of time, to make a calendar, if suddenly you couldn't talk, if suddenly you couldn't write, think how much different your life would be. You wouldn't function as well. And the same is true if you were to lose those right brain skills. And in the same way, we need both those primitive parts of our brain to keep our heart regulated, to keep our temperature steady. We need to be able to run out of the way, fight or flight, if we're attacked, or if we see a truck coming at us up the street. We need those primitive parts, but we can't, you know, we can't live in just the one moment. Otherwise, we wouldn't learn anything from history or our past mistakes, and we couldn't anticipate the future. So it's kind of a long answer to that question about following your bliss. Following your bliss is a double-edged sword if you don't take into account everything that the brain is, is, is capable of. You need to follow your bliss. You need to listen to your heart. But you also have to understand what are the consequences of my actions today down the line. You have to ask yourself, if I do what feels good today, how is that going to feel a week from now or a month from now or a year from now? Follow what I'm saying? Yeah. The brain sense. power comes from using a whole your whole brain, not just how you feel at the moment, that's part of the formula. That's a very important part of the formula, but it's only part of the formula. You've got to think in terms of whole brain. And so it's, it's kind of a long answer to that question, uh, you know, what happens if we just, you know, follow our bliss or, or, or uh, you know, do what makes us feel good it's a little more complicated question than that. And the, and the beauty of, of understanding your brain is you start to understand things like empathy and compassion and your emotions. Uh, you get a, a very, you see how all those things fit together. And it keeps you from oversimplifying processes, uh, uh so, so that you, you have a much better toolbox to work with, you know, to get from where you are now to where you want to go down the road. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. I was just noticing, like, looking back at times in my life where I felt that I was the most creative or intuitive, um... And it appears that uh, during those times I was kind of, you know, following my heart, so to speak, or my bliss or whatever, as opposed to the more structured times where I was in environments, you know, doing things more because I had to than I wanted to. It appeared that, I mean, I forgot I had any creativity whatsoever, and my intuition, I mean, I totally lost discernment. It was all out the window. What do you attribute that to? Well, in ter- you know, in edu- and I, I have a degree in education, and there's a thing, there's a, there's a word called downshifting. Mm-hmm. And educators are very familiar with this. When a child is stressed out, when they're being punished, when they feel that they're being threatened, at one level or another, what happens in their brain is they downshift and they're not able to learn as well. Sometimes they're not able to learn at at all when they are clicked backward into this defensive position where they're feeling they're having to, uh, that they're being threatened or they're being caged in. It's called downshifting. And... Just the opposite happens when you give a kid the freedom to explore. When you say, you don't have to do things this way, just kind of, you know, just play around a bit. Just play. And uh, it's, a, it's a well-known phenomenon that if a, if a child is, say, learning uh, a new language or a new skill, uh, 
if you just allow them that freedom to just kind of mess around unstructured first, that leads to better problem solving that if you say, okay, here's how we solve the problem. You do A, B, C, D, E, and you go in that order, and this is how you have to do it. It's much better to, to let the kid explore for a while. And when they do that, they kind of, they, they seem to make sense out of what they're looking at much more efficiently and effectively than if everything is tightly structured to begin with. And the structure is very useful later on, but it's very important to have that first initial unstructured level of play to occur. And typically we relate play with doing something that we enjoy. Yeah. So it's it's very it's very important to kind of be aware of that particular phenomenon, and you know, as adults, in in exactly the same way that kids have that experience. Mm, definitely. And and the, the 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 other thing, and we and as we start to maybe talk about paranormal types of things, the same thing occurs when you talk about paranormal experience that there is a distinct relationship between these advanced brain processes of uh, logic and intuition, the higher levels of intuition, and all of these frontal lobe types of processes, they're very closely related to the paranormal experience, as whereas these more primitive uh, functions, such as fight or flight or competition, those seem to to uh, lend themselves to inhibiting those kinds of paranormal experiences uh, in just the opposite way. Mm. Okay, so, you know, we're kind of getting uh, into the topic here a little bit more with the paranormal aspect of it. I'd like, let's kind of start off from the beginning. What is, how do we define paranormal? Well, we have five regular senses that everybody's familiar with. That would be, and if you look at your well, head, you're allowed to know. What? You, well, yeah. if you just look at your head, you could, they're really easy to remember. You've got, you've got vision, you've got smell, you've got taste, you've got hearing, and then of course you have touch, which is, you know, your fingers and of course all the, all of your skin surface is going to be touched as well. So those are your five normal senses. But you also have five paranormal senses. And most of the paranormal experience can be filed under one of these five paranormal experiences. So that would be telepathy is number one. That's what most people think of. That's knowing what another person is uh, thinking or knowing what they're feeling without having any direct sensory information like reading somebody else's mind, okay? That's what telepathy is. Then you have precognition. Precognition, precognition is knowing what's going to happen in the future beyond what sensory information you may have. The regular senses are all dependent upon input, sensory information that's coming in. Paranormal senses are not that way. Sounds like we'll, we'll pick it up after the break too, right? Yeah, we'll get to the other three. Segment. Yeah, well, way too fast. So uh, hang on, everyone. We will continue this after this break. Stay tuned. Neil Slade and Julia Liu here on SoulJourneysRadio.com. It's time to get real and heal. MyTrueEssence.net would like to tell you about Modifiland Brown Seaweed Extract. It's composed of an elementally rich seaweed called Laminaria. It takes 40 pounds of Laminaria to make just one pound of Modifiland. There's nothing else like Modifiland. It is the richest in alginate, phocoidin, organic iodine, and lamarian. Alginates are the most effective organic element in nature that enable the body to rid itself of heavy metals, radioactive elements, and toxins. Phocoidin is an extremely effective anti-cancer substance found abundantly in brown seaweed. Organic iodine is the greatest protection for the thyroid offered by nature. Laminarin aids in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Go to www.mytrueessence.net and click the Modifiland banner to get started on your path to rich health today. Also check out the healing shop for proven essential oils, medicinal teas, and even health coaching. It's time to get real and heal. Go to www.mytrueessence.net. 
Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. Welcome to the world's meeting place. American. It's practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. They're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Leah Liu. Neil is an author of 10 books uh, based on uh, brain and uh, behavior. Tickle your amygdala, frontal lobe supercharge, the secret of the dormant brain lab, the book of wands, and brain magic 2, um, which uh, also um, was co-written by his wife, Julia Liu. Uh, creativity from another dimension, and I can't wait to hear from her again. But Neil, you were sharing with us um, the other three uh, so-called paranormal uh, aspects. Right. So, so the first one was telepathy, the second being precognition. Then we have clear audience, which is when you hear something, but there's no auditory stimulus. There's no auditory explanation. You might hear a bell ringing or you might hear someone's voice, but they're not there, and there's no bell. So it's you're receiving an auditory signal within the brain without any sensory input. The same thing for clairvoyance, when you have a vision. You know, when Julia was talking about a TV screen on her forehead where she could see something so real, like the flower, but the flower's not there. Uh, you might have a flash of a vision. And uh, so that's, that's clairvoyance. And finally, you have telekinesis, which is objects that move out being uh, uh, moved by your hand or by some other object. It's, uh, it's the movement of objects without any type of uh, physical manipulation. And that's, that's related. That, that's, a, that's not exactly a sense, but it's related to our experience. So you've got those five different types of paranormal experience or sensitivity. Now what's interesting is that every single one of those paranormal experiences relate to a specific region inside the frontal lobes, the more advanced part of your brain. If they don't relate to the primitive structures in the brain. For example, telepathy, knowing what someone else is thinking or feeling, well, there's a part of the brain in the frontal lobes called the premedial cortex, and it's right in between the two. It's, it's in the fold in the front of the brain in between the right and left hemispheres. And that part of the brain allows you to have empathy for another person or another creature, it could even be a dog or a cat, it allows you to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. And there was an interesting study done in a prison that I've talked about before. And they studied two different types of prisoners. One was a more normal criminal that it was uh, um, uh, incarcerated for a violent crime. They were both, both groups were uh, were violent criminals. But the difference was one group, the control group, felt remorse and they felt that they understood that they did something wrong and they were sorry for that. They understood what it was like for the victim. The other group had no remorse. They had no ability to recognize that they did was something wrong. So one group could put themselves in another person's shoes, and the other group could not. And the group that could not were psychopaths. Mm -hmm. And they did brain scans of both groups. And sure enough, the psychopaths had no activation in this premedial cortex. That part of their brain was either damaged or not functional. The group of prisoners who could put themselves in the shoes of their victims had a normally functioning premedial cortex. So what that showed us was that this ability to feel empathy was in this frontal lobes region of the brain. And if you think about telepathy, what is that but an extension of that ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes? Yeah. Normally, we get 
sensory information. We interpret the sound of someone's voice. We see the expression on someone's face. Or we, in our imagination, which is also part of the frontal lobe's processing, these are all normal frontal lobe's processes that allow us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Telepathy is an extension of that normal frontal lobe's ability that allows us, even without sensory information, to know what another person is thinking or feeling. And that can be, that can happen from 10,000 miles away. Mm. And each one of these paranormal senses, for example, I'll give you another one, precognition. Well, the ability to predict the future at a normal level is a frontal lobe's process. It allows us to calculate cause and effect. That if I touch this lever with this hand, you, you know, you've seen a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Do you know uh, what I'm speaking of? No. Well, you remember the game? The, do you remember the game Mouse Trap? Oh yes, I do. But well, one thing connected to another thing, which was connected to another thing. So if you, it's sort of like dominoes. You know, that, that's a dominoes is a good example. If you have a row of dominoes, you know that if you touch the domino on one end, eventually the domino on the other end will fall, right? Mm-hmm. That's an ability of the of the frontal lobes. And if you lose your frontal lobes, if your if your frontal lobes are damaged, you lose that ability to connect the dots. And by connecting the dots, you can logically figure out what's going to happen, you know, down the future, right? Precognition is an extension of that natural frontal lobe's ability to know what's going to happen in the future, but you don't have any sensory data. You don't have a line of dominoes. You just have a feeling. You have an intuition, or it's spelled out in front of you. Maybe it's clairvoyance. You'll see a picture. Maybe it's clairaudience. You'll hear a voice saying, hey, you know, don't get on this plane. Follow what I'm saying? So... We have these natural frontal lobes abilities, and the parent, all of the paranormal abilities are further developments and extensions of that. Mm. So okay. the idea here is if you're interested in extending your sensitivity in becoming more sensitive to the paranormal level, mm-hmm. to where it'll kick in when your normal senses are not quite enough to do the job, you want to stay tickled forward into your frontal lobe because as you click backwards into fight or flight into just pure reactive thinking, then all of those paranormal sensitivities become diminished and become uh, less and less sensitive. So that's, that's the real key to becoming more paranormally sensitive is to just stay forward in your normal frontal lobe uh, abilities and processes. Okay, that makes sense. And Neil, I know you've shared with us uh, many times before uh, the process of tickling your amygdala, but just in case this is somebody's first time uh, listening to you tonight, can you share that process with us? Yeah, I think what I'd like to do is use the example of popcorn. I All right. Because we the, like popcorn. Yeah, well, the, the amygdala is situated right next to the olfactory bulbs in our brain. In other words, the amygdala is really an evolutionarily uh, developed uh, part of the brain that's very closely related to our sense of smell. And the, the, the reason why we have the sense of smell is because you can often smell danger when you can't see it. Or you can smell good food. You know, when animals are out in the wild, their nose allows them to pick up sense, sense miles away that's beyond their hearing and beyond their vision. So it allows them to really extend their sensitivity far in advance. Okay? Um, and the amygdala sits right next to those olfactory bolts. They kind of go right smack right into the amygdala. So you can know the difference between when your amygdala is tickled forward and when it's clicked backwards. You can familiarize yourself with that sensation by your sense of smell, okay? So if you want to know what it's like for your amygdala to click backwards, go find some moldy food in your refrigerator. 
something that's been sitting in there for a month and open up the jar and stick your nose in it and take a good whiff and you'll just go oh that smells terrible or open a bottle well i don't know that this would be very healthy uh you know find something that you really find smelling repulsive and i'm sure everyone can think of a few things around the house <laughs> right <laughs> Go and stick your nose in that smell. And what's going to happen is that bad smell is going to automatically click your amygdala backward into your reptile brain. And you'll just, you'll be repelled. You're going to know this is not good. You're going to know you don't want to eat this because it smells bad. Okay? You've been genetically programmed to be repelled by bad smells. That's your amygdala clicking backward into reptile brain okay then once you've done that think of something that you love the smell of maybe it's roses and some fresh cut flowers or maybe it's fresh popcorn with butter so make your go pop yourself some popcorn make some uh, pour a little melted butter on it and smell that oh yeah and you want to go towards that right or maybe chocolate. Maybe you love the smell of chocolate, right? Go smell a piece of chocolate cake. You'll be drawn towards that because at some level you know, hey, this is healthy. This is good for me. That is your amygdala being tickled forward. That's, a, that's the easiest way to identify what it feels like when your amygdala is clicked backwards and when it's being tickled forward, Okay. That's the, the easiest way to tickle your amygdala is smell something good. Ah, okay? No now, wonder why I love smelling myself after I make all my oils so, and creams. I'm like, mmm. <laughs> so that's how aromatherapy, that's one of the reasons aromatherapy is so good for you because it tickles your amygdala forward and it begins that whole process of, of, you know, you were taught, we were talking earlier about what's the detrimental effects of being clicked backwards, right? That, it, you know, and, you know, when you're clicked backwards, you get stress and, uh, it, it causes a premature aging, uh, it causes you to lose sleep. All kinds of things happen when you're clicked backwards. I mean, just think of what would happen to you if you were around bad smelling things all the time. You would just be miserable and you'd get sick. On the other hand, if you're around good smelling things, that's going to be healthy for you. And that's how aroma therapy works to a great extent. And it's, 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 aroma therapy is tickling your amygdala forward and it's turning on your frontal lobes as well because there's that, that connection there as well. Now, that totally makes sense. Okay, and because the limbic system is right next to the amygdala. Well, the amygdala is part of the limbic system is is the name for all of these uh, parts of the brain that are kind of situated in the middle of the brain. The limbic system is the emotional part of the brain, mm -hmm. and the and the and it controls basic basic social and nurturing kinds of things. So the amygdala okay. is part of of that limbic system. Okay, and then some oils are um, supposedly help uh, stimulate the pineal gland, and you know I never really thought of aromatherapy in this manner until uh, what you shared with us here this segment, Neil. But I'm just my mind's going a million miles a minute, and it totally makes sense um, because meditation is so much easier, relaxation, uh, focus, clarity creativity, it's just, wow, it, well, it really makes sense what you're saying. When we talk about tickling the amygdala, we're not just talking about one process. We're talking about really an infinite variety of things that can cause that shift in your brain to activate the more advanced parts of your brain, as opposed to clicking the amygdala backwards, which shuts down the bigger parts and the more advanced parts of your brain. So there's a, there's, there's all kinds of things that you can do that will tickle your amygdala forward. And, and that's why the, you know, the new book that I wrote, the Tickle Your Amygdala book, I talked with 56 different people all over the world. And each one of these people tickled their amygdala in a different way. 
there's not just one way to do it. What you have to do as an individual is find out what is the best way for you to tickle your amygdala. Sometimes you'll use smell. Other times you'll use your imagination. Other times you'll use music. And other times you'll just maybe quiet meditation. So the best plan is to understand, first of all, what tickling your amygdala is really all about. And then start to explore all the different ways that you can do it. Sometimes a method will work for you on one day, but that same method will not work for you at all on another day. Mm. So there's all different levels and layers to understanding what the amygdala is and what tickling forward is all about. Okay, Neil. Wow. Very good explanation. But it is that time again. We have to take a short break. So hang on, everyone. We're oh heading up to the home home stretch here after this short break. Stay tuned. SoulJourneysRadio.com. It's time to get real and heal. MyTrueEssence.net would like to tell you about Modifiland Brown Seaweed Extract. It's composed of an elementally rich seaweed called Laminaria. It takes 40 pounds of Laminaria to make just one pound of Modifiland. There's nothing else like Modifiland. It is the richest in alginate, phocoidin, organic iodine, and lamarian. Alginates are the most effective organic element in nature that enable the body to rid itself of heavy metals, radioactive elements, and toxins. Phocoidin is an extremely effective anti-cancer substance found abundantly in brown seaweed. Organic iodine is the greatest protection for the thyroid offered by nature. Laminarin aids in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Go to www.mytrueessence.net and click the Modifiland banner to get started on your path to rich health today. Also check out the healing shop for proven essential oils, medicinal teas, and even health coach. It's time to get real and heal. Go to www.mytrueessence.net. Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. News and information you can trust. This is American Freedom Radio. Freedom, freedom, American Freedom Radio. Radio. American Freedom Radio. All right, welcome back, and thanks again for joining us here tonight. Last segment here with our special guests, Neil Slade and Julia Liu. Their websites, once again, brainradar.com, and there are seriously hundreds, if not thousands, of pages you can get lost in there, brainradar.com, so check it out, or Julia Painting. Dot com. She has shared uh, um, at least a hundred of her beautiful paintings that she kind of busted out just in, in the last couple years after leaving her career and doctorates and you know law school and all of that, which I just think is a wonderful story in itself. I'm wondering, uh, Julia, did your uh, Paranormal experiences increase as you learned about uh, various ways to tickle your amygdala, so to speak? Yes, definitely. Okay. What techniques have you the, used? Well, at the beginning, I just followed Neil's book. Uh, he, he talking about how to close your eyes, imagine you have the feather and tickle your amygdala. And uh, after, you know, you do that for many times, it's just like uh, become a habit. You don't have to really imagine anything. You just think about a pickle or you think about a amygdala or sometimes you even think about a T and A and it had the same effect. You suddenly you feel like some kind of electricity passing through your body. You just get a excited mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it but uh, I become I think uh, you be, your brain become uh, so accustomed to that uh, position and you just don't feel anything anymore it's become your the default mode I did not pay her to say that <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I mean, both of you, I know you just got married a couple years ago. I think it was one eleven eleven. Yeah. Is that right? We, okay. We got married on January 11th, 2011 at 11, 11 a.m. Okay. And our receipt at the mar- and we didn't plan it. We just kind of went down there and we realized it when we were down there. 
as far as the time went, we knew it was going to be on the 11th. We just we looked at the uh, receipt and the marriage certificate. Turned out it was 1111, and the receipt number itself said 711 on it. <laughs> oh wow! So there's a plug <laughs> for 711, I guess. Okay, so in the last two years, I mean, you both have produced a lot of work together. Your books, your music, your painting, et cetera. So um, what do you, well, what methods do you use? Or do you have to, do you feel that you have to prepare yourself before you start creating more paintings or music? Or are you just, it comes so naturally to you at this point, you can basically sit down and create anytime you want. Um, I think of both. Sometimes we mm-hmm. do, um, you know, if we have some idea, we always just share. When Neil working on some project, sometimes he will wake up me at night and suddenly talking about his new idea. And if I had some idea about how I'm going to spend the next series, I discuss with him too. And then we take a lot of time walking. Walking for me is a very, if, uh, in particular when I'm, I'm writing, uh, uh, I find walking really kind of connects the circuit. And I talk about that in the Book of Wands in terms of, you know, what kind of tools you can use to tickle your amygdala and move into these kind of paranormal sensitivities and things. For me, just Getting outside in the fresh air and walking and carrying a walking stick with me, that sort of make it's almost like making an electrical connection. Um, uh, it, it always helps for me to get out of the immediate uh, environment just for a little bit, and then I come back and can kind of put all the pieces together. But it's very important. The most important thing is really to recognize for me when I'm clicked backwards into my reptile brain. Because if I'm clicked backwards, I can't get anything done. And if I do something and I'm clicked backwards, it's crap. So for me, you know, it's it's most important to be tickled forward to make that kind of connection with my frontal lobes and with whatever cosmic connections that there may be out there. And once that I'm tickled forward and can make that connection then I can get some really creative stuff done. Um, and I'm doing new stuff rather than just, you know, so many people just repeat the same thing. They just keep doing the, you know, they were successful at doing one thing, so they just keep doing that same thing over and over again, and they grow stale. That's not what creativity, creativity is exploration. It's going somewhere new, and that's that's very important to me, and I see that in Julia. She's always trying different things, and she's inventing new ways to paint and new ways of seeing things, and I think it's very important. I love on your, since you brought that up, new ways. Um, on your website, uh, you said creativity solves problems in unique new ways. You combine things as never before like creating a chocolate-covered sledgehammer <laughs> that you can eat after you're done whacking nails with it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, pretty, that. that's a pretty good example. That's what creativity is. That's synthesize. It's, creativity is synthesis. It's, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, but the way you can combine things, that's what, that's creativity. That's new. It's probably new to us. For example, I had this um, interesting creative experience just a couple days ago. I was uh, painting a shelf uh, for my office, and I really didn't know what I was going to do, but I was just kind of going with the flow, and I'm looking at all the pretty dandelions and weeds and, you know, kind of the spring stuff that isn't going to be around forever, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I you know, tried to paint a dandelion on here. And, you know, because I was just going to paint, try to paint flowers on it, but dandelions were right there, and, hmm, I wonder if this will work. And then it just turned into this big, crazy work of art that I had no idea, you know, I definitely didn't plan for. So, 
Yeah, it's, you know, these things, it's like you said, probably nothing new under the planet, probably been done somewhere else, but it was totally new to me, and it just felt so good to just kind of go with it and, you know, kind of removing that um, shame, I think, that society wants to impose upon us. Oh, well, it has to be that way, and you're breaking all the rules, and, you know, especially in music and such, you know, the fusions, which, you know, obviously it's not so taboo anymore, but, um, yeah, well, I think that, that, well, it's a wonderful place to be. That, that brings people often ask, what clicks your amygdala backward? And, in you know... So much of the time, it has to do with cultural conformity, and it has to do with society, and uh, and and what we are told is right and what we are told is wrong. And very often, uh, our behavior and our activity is misguided by what society or culture says. This is right. This is wrong. And. Uh, what we need to do as individuals is is to really know at a much deeper level, you know, what what is right, what is wrong, and that I, you know that comes from you know uh, uh, experience. It comes from self reflection, and it has and it comes from this inner sense of knowing which direction we should go. And you know, our amygdala, that little emotional magnetics compass. That's going to give us very often, you know, that last bit of guidance that we need to have as to, you know, what we should do and what we should avoid. Mm, and as it's, it's as true in terms of moral predicaments as it is in terms of creative predicaments. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I'm I'm looking at the clock here, and I've really had a fantastic time with you both, but I think we have about, like, 90 seconds left. So let me ask you first, Julia, is there anything else you would like to share with us tonight about uh, your journey and tickling your amygdala and your creative, you know, spurt that you've been experiencing the last few years? Um, I just feel like uh, as... Um Artist or as anybody, you have to constantly um, experiencing and constantly create. You always come up with some original idea. Don't repeat yourself or simply copy somebody else. That's it. Mm, yeah, very I, good advice. And people, Neil? I want to tell people if they want to see what Julia has done recently, if they go to her site, um, there's several new videos up. One of her uh, mural and of her uh, new paintings, and uh, people enjoy looking at that that video very much. I'm I'm sure of it. Excellent. Well, I just posted that link in the text chat, and I'm definitely going to be watching those videos. I want to thank you both for joining us here tonight. It's been a wonderful time, and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Again, uh, Neil is the author of Tickle Your Amygdala, uh, Brain Magic. Um, let's see, there's 10 books out there. Frontal Lobe Supercharge, The Secret of the Dormant Brain Lab, The Book of Wands, uh, Creativity from Another Dimension that Julia wrote, so you can check them out on their website, brainradar.com or Julia Painting. Dot com. Thank you all for joining us here tonight. Abundant blessings and love to you all, and we will see you tomorrow night. SoulJourneysRadio.com It's time to get real and heal. MyTrueEssence.net would like to tell you about Modifiland Brown Seaweed Extract. It's composed of an elementally rich seaweed called Laminaria. It takes 40 pounds of Laminaria to make just one pound of Modifiland. There's nothing else like Modifiland. It is the richest in alginate, phocoidin, organic iodine, and lamarian. Alginates are the most effective organic element in nature that enable the body to rid itself of heavy metals, radioactive elements, and toxins. Phocoidin is an extremely effective anti-cancer substance found abundantly in brown seaweed. Organic iodine is the greatest protection for the thyroid offered by nature. Laminarin aids in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. Go to www.mytrueessence.net and click the Modifiland banner to get started on your path to rich health today. Also check out the healing shop for proven essential oils, medicinal teas, and even health coaching. It's time to get real and heal. Go to www.mytrueessence.net.
MyTrueEssence.net. Get real and heal. Listen to Christy on Soul Journeys Radio. You're listening to the future of talk. American Freedom Radio. This is American Freedom Radio.